The Pilgrim's First Christmas by Josephine Pittman Scrinner. It was a bleak December day in the year 1620. All day long, the Mayflower struggled along the coast amidst the rain and snow, her rudder broken, her mast split in three pieces, and heavy seas dashing over her bow. The men had been called to man the oars, and all were filled with anxiety and grief, and apprehension of unknown perils to be faced. It was as if the Almighty would try them, as he tried Abraham. What could now sustain them but the Spirit of God and his grace? If they looked behind them there was the mighty ocean, which they had passed and which was now as a main bar and gulf to separate them from all the civil parts of the world. If they looked forward, what could feed their hopes, what could they see but the weather-beaten face of the wilderness, the summer gone and the whole country full of wild beasts and wild men? And what multitudes there might be of them, they knew not. Locked in the airless cabins, with the hatches battened down, were the women and children. Twenty little children to amuse and keep quiet, while mother hearts were heavy with fear and terror. Moving among them was an English maid, divinely fair in her beauty. No need for her to paint her cheeks of damask and rose. In her strength and beauty she was as an angel of light to the homesick pilgrim woman. The day had been long and dreary to Mary Chilton. All night she had dreamed and all day she had thought of dear and mighty England of the lanes and the fields and the songs of the birds, the faces of the neighbors going about and the church at the end of the village street with the abbey on the tower. The tears started to her eyes. She turned away to hide them, but they did not escape the notice of John Winslow, who was bending over the oars. He's brave, Mary! He set his face firmly. Surely she must not falter now, she, who in her own splendid health had nursed the sick, amused the children, restless at the prolonged confinement, kept the Billington boy from serious mischief. A task at which strong men quailed and instilled courage and hope in the hearts of the weak. Even as he watched her, her tears vanished and her smile beamed down on the Billington boy, who spoke to her. Tell me, Mistress Murray, what am I going to find in my shoe on Santa Claus morning? She shook her head gaily. Ah, that is a secret we must wait to find out upon the blessed Christmas morning. No, only naughty boys get hay in their shoes on Nicholas Day, and you've promised me, Francis, you know, to keep out of mischief. But will there be something? He insisted. I cannot promise, Francis, we must hope and wait. Between the beat of the oars, John Winslow called out softly. She moved nearer him. What ails you? Are you sad? My heart is sore, John. I know it is wrong. I love my people and my religion is dear to me, but I wish I were back in England. Just think, John, it is the blessed Christmas week. They are making merry all over England, in holodeck halls, with great fires roaring up the chimneys. Feasts are being prepared, and families are drawing together in love and communion. And look at our position tossed on a strange coast, with no harbor to enter, no friends to welcome us, no ones to entertain us and refresh our weather-beaten bodies, no place to seek for succor. Said John. But Robert Coppin, our pilot, bids us be of good cheer, that there is sure to be a creek or river to enter and escape this angry sea. And, Mary, I pray you do not plague your heart about that young scape Grace Billington. I cannot comprehend how such a profane wretch as his father came to be shuffled in with a company of pilgrims. He was not of the Lynn Church, it is sure. And that boy, it is providential that the whole ship was not blown up when he fired that fowling piece almost within four feet of the gunpowder barrel. He did not know the danger. He has been cooped up and it is hard to keep so many little boys out of mischief. With such a father, I grieve for him and for all these little children on board, that any joy should be cut out of their lives. I pray you, Mary, go to your rest, and I promise you on my honor, that the morning light will bring comfort and joy. Already the sea is abating and Robert Copping, our pilot, says all will be well. Your example has been a star of hope. Do not yield to despondency now. I will not, John. It was the storm and thinking of Christmas at home. And you, John, promise me that when you go ashore I may go too. I am like the young man in the Bible. I want to go out to see what I can see. Good night until tomorrow and may the Lord keep you. When the morning broke bright and clear, the Mayflower lay inside a good harbor where a hundred sail of ships might enter. To the wary pilgrims the first view of their new home was delightful. All around were the trees of the Lord. The mighty setters, down to the very edge of the waters, 
There were oaks, pines, junipers, sassafras, and other sweet woods they knew not, so the first otters that greeted them were not from burning hearth fires, but the balsamic odors of the forest. When the shallop was made ready, sixteen armed men, some of the women with the linen and clothing to wash on shore, Murray Chilton and John Winslow, entered it and, it being flood tide, made a safe landing on the shallow beach. Mary Chilton stepped from the little shallop onto a large boulder, and the history of woman in America, and the fame of Plymouth Rock began with her. The others are so busy with their linens. They have not noticed that I am the first woman to step foot on the new land, and you are the first woman to step into the kingdom of my heart. Said John, softly, and thus, under the fragrant boughs of the pines, their troth was plighted. The other woman exclaimed over the fresh pure water which they found in the excellent clay which washed like soap. It had not been possible to wash on board ship, and it can be imagined they had plenty to do on this first American. Mary and John walked down the dim azales of the forest. They found many pure little brooks and drank the fresh water with delight. They built a fire to signal to the Mayflower that all was right. Mary ran from one tree to another, recognizing them as old friends. Look, John, it is holly like our own and yet not like it in cedar and, ah, oh, John, here is the ground pine, our own ground pine, trailing its garlands over the ground. And walnut trees full of nuts and great store of strawberry and great vines. Mary's face glowed with a sudden thought. John, we will celebrate Christmas here in this new land. It is true we have no stately halls to deck with greenery, no great chimneys for the roaring fires, no old bells to ring out the glad tidings on the holy morning, but we can trim the cabin of the Mayflower with holly and cedar. Look, here is wood. We can have a sparkling fire on the hearth box. We will have carols, for you know that we pilgrims can sing, John. And we can have the communion of friends, and we can show our love like Christians indeed one to another. But John shook his head gravely. No, Mary, there will be those who will protest and mutter against the observance of the pagan festival. It savors of Rome, and you know well that we have set our faces against anything that is used in popery. These are the things from which we have fled. Do not be so straight-laced, John. Are we not required to keep in pious memory such holy days as the birth, death, and resurrection? It is meet that we should commemorate our landing upon these shores. Do you know, John? that I am deeply moved by the thought that all these first days here are holy days. Although the glory and the sunlight is hidden from us by distress, privation, and sickness, yet I prophesy that long, long years from now, when our graves are leveled and all has vanished, men will stand with bared heads upon this sacred spot. What we do now will all be noted. Let it not be said that we forgot the examples of oppression and intolerance which have always been before us, forgot the bitter lessons we have learned, and failed to be kind and charitable and yielding in little and indifferent things. Those are old thoughts for such a young head, Mary, and in some way you twist the words to suit yourself, but go to our dear and loving friend, Elder Brewster, and see if he deems it fitting. Uh, he is so affectionate and tender-hearted, uh, that I am sure he will wish to take part in our joys as he has partaken of our distresses. I know what I would do if I were he, uh, said John, smiling down at her happy face. I would let you do it. But John must not shirk the burden of the work, which was to procure firewood and water for use on the ship. And when the little shallop returned to the Mayflower, it was laden with casks of fresh water, boughs of cedar and juniper wood, garlands of ground pine, walnuts, a great store, branches of the red holly berries, and the wicks and sprays of the bayberries. And Mary Chilton kept her plan in her heart. Upon the counsel of Elder Brewster, she went straightway to Master Jones, the captain of the ship, and unfolded it to him. The captain was a rough sadduck but capable of goodly feeling and kindly impulses. He was fair-minded and friendly and listened to her with respectful attention and when she had done, promised to lend his head to make their first Christmas in the new land as nearly like an English holiday as their means and circumstances would permit. On the 25th of December the little company assembled at night, in the cabin of the Mayflower. Garlands of ground pine decked the walls and holy buffs graced the posts. The cedar wood burning on the sand hearth smelled very sweet and strong. They kneeled and gave thanks to God for the completion of their perilous journey. Friends, we are far from home, with unknown dangers facing us, but let us forget, this night, all that may be in store for us and remember that the whole civil world is celebrating the birth of Christ. Let it be understood that in no way are we departing from the principles for which we suffered in England, fled to Holland, crossed the ocean, and landed here in this distant, savage, 
and even dangerous lane. God has not revealed his whole will to us, but he has made to burn within us a desire for English laws, English manners, and an English home and education for our children. It is no priestly rite which we are celebrating here, it is the manifestation of the pilgrim spirit, this gathering together, in one, as the children of God, into Tresome liberty. It is the season of peace and goodwill, when disaffections are forgotten and friendships are cemented more closely, and all people, as the wise men of old, come bearing gifts. The first Christmas gift, which is ours from this new land, is this. And he held aloft in his hand a goblet of sparkling water, fresh and clear and pure. This comes from a sweet brook that runs under a hillside in many delicate springs, and is as good water as can be drunk. He pointed silently to the water casks, the famished thirsty ones, who for an hundred days had not tasted any but stored water crowded around the casks, and drank their first New England water with as much delight as ever they drank drink in their lives. Then Elder Brewster pointed to a large basket of corn or maize, some red, some yellow, and some marked with blue, a goodly sight. This, my friends, is a gift of providence, without which I do not know what we would do. We will not eat it, but will guard it as precious seed with which to make the plantation. They could not admire it enough, never having seen anything like it except in the museum at Leyden. Scan as their food had been and still bid fair to be for a space, they all agreed that the seed was a gift of God and must be guarded as such. It is given us to establish the principles of self-government and freedom of worship, and to deepen and expand the faith. And now, friends, thanks to our hunters, we have a feast prepared of roast goose and fowls, which will make a pleasant change from the dried meats tongue and holland cheese and biscuits of the ship's diet. We had like to have some deer. And here he smiled knowingly. The men saw some and shot at them, but missed them. Thomas Bradford said that one buck over the shoulder was worth three in a bush. There was a shout of lauder at the discomfited hunters, and then they bowed their heads to say grace and then fell to with many expressions of goodwill. It was sweet and comfortable to see such lively and true expressions of dear and unfin love. While they were feasting, Mary Chilton slipped away. Down in a lowly bed lay a mother and a young babe, even as that other mother of old, low and mean and poor the surroundings, but holding the hope almost divine of a people. Mary bent over the brooding mother, and in her face was an adoration not of earth but of heaven. She said softly, said the mother, I but lie here wondering what this new land has to give my baby. I am heartsick with fear. Mary put a sprig of bayberries in her slender hand and replied. Rather, Susanna, ask what your babe will give to the new land. He will give his strength and his faith and his youth. Give him to me a moment. And she bore him up to the company. Friends, I bring to you another Christmas gift. I bring to you a new citizen, born in the land of the free with no heritage of oppression and cruelty. It's citizen! It's citizen! It is an omen! They cried, and little peregrine white was handed around and admired while the pilgrims sang, with lusty voices, the good old English girl. Unto us a child is born. Susan White, lying there in her lowly bed, heard and marveled, and was content. And so the gifts were passed that first Christmas in 1620. They reveled in things of the soul rather than the body. They counted their tale of gifts and they were good. The clear, sparkling water, the seed corn, precious as jewels, the beginning of the free, fair homes, the new citizen, the little pilgrim, and the great gift of self-government and the freedom to worship according to the dictates of their consciences and to deepen and expand the living faith. But the greatest gift of all is the mighty nation that has sprung from their loins. They have multiplied as the stars of the havens and as the sand which is on the seashore. As the children of peace, they have received peace, and the divine blessing rests upon them. Italicized text is surrounded by underscores italics. Obvious typographical errors have been corrected. Inconsistencies in hyphenation have been standardized. Archaic or alternate spelling has been retained from the original.